What's good, sports fans? Are you ready to elevate your live entertainment experience? Well, let me introduce you to SeatGeek, an amazing platform that connects you to your favorite events while saving you money. With SeatGeek, you can easily find tickets for sports games, concerts, and so much more, all in one place. The interface is user-friendly, making it simple to browse and compare prices. And one of the best features is the interactive seating chart. You can see exactly where you'll be sitting and how much you'll be spending, ensuring you get the best value for your money. But here's the best part. Check this out. By using my promo code, Chalk It Up Sports, you can enjoy a one-time $20 discount on your first SeatGeek order. That's right, $20 off your first SeatGeek order. Imagine catching that thrilling game or concert without breaking the bank. It's a win-win situation. Plus, you'll be a part of a community of fans who eat, sleep, and breathe live events just as much as you do. So what are you waiting for? Click the link in the description to download the SeatGeek app today. And don't forget to use my promo code, Chalk It Up Sports, for a one-time $20 discount on your first SeatGeek order. Get excited. Now let's get back to the show. You know, despite all the ups and the downs that this team has experienced and put us through, the Philadelphia Eagles still have that fight in them. That's the one thing that was on display. That's the one thing that was on display, right? Despite all the turbulence, all the ups, all the downs, all the cake, all the chaos, you still saw a football team that has pride. You saw a football team that has grit, that has guts, that still has that fervor and that desire to win football games and to put up a good product. It ain't over to the fat lady sing. And I'm going to be honest with y'all. I'm going to be totally honest because y'all my people. When the Saints drove down the field and they scored that touchdown off of the, uh, off of uh, Chris Olave, the Chris Olave touchdown, I'll be honest. I thought we lost the game. I thought the game was over. I'm just being fair with you guys. I'm being honest. I had a moment of doubt yesterday. I didn't get a chance to speak about that yesterday, but I had a moment of doubt. After the Saints drove down the field and Chris Olave scored that touchdown, I thought we were finito, if I'm being honest. But Jalen Hurts, Dallas Goddard, Saquon Barkley, they showed up in tremendous fashion when it mattered most, right? So listen, hear me out. After last week's game, after last week's loss to the Falcons, we all asked ourselves, does this Eagles team have any heart? Especially on the defensive side. We said that to ourselves. Does this team have heart? I, I, I read y'all tweets. I read, I, I read some of y'all comments, some of them. I don't, read, I don't read them all. But I read y'all tweets. And y'all tweets were very clear. Does this team have heart? Do they have pride? Are they going to look in the mirror and say, you know what? These past two weeks or whatever happened last week is unacceptable. Speaking for myself, I had no idea of what to expect in this Saints game, this matchup with the Philadelphia Eagles. I had no idea what to expect. Sure, I had my, my, my predictions and so on and so forth, right? But overall, I had no idea what to expect because the defense – was dealing with their own issues. The offense was still trying to get their bearings with the new OC and things of that nature, right? You know, Jalen Hurts and his turnover issues. We're going to talk about that later on. But I had no idea of what to really expect in this game, knowing how good the Saints have been the past couple weeks, knowing how explosive they've been, knowing how good they've been on defense. They've been a hard team to gauge. Same thing for the Philadelphia Eagles. So again, speaking for myself, I had no idea on what to expect going into this game. We knew the offense at the time, prior to the game. We knew the offense was capable of putting up points. And we knew the defense could definitely hang their hat on their red zone efficiency. Eagles, I believe, right now, or prior to the game, were top 10 in points. Um, they were top 10 in red zone efficiency on defense. So we knew this defense, we knew this team could put points up and they could and they could also prevent teams from putting points on the board. More like touchdowns, right? We knew that. But other than that, we knew this Eagles team struggled to stop the run. 
We knew they struggled to we knew we knew they struggled to run to rush the passer to get to the quarterback. And we also knew this Eagles quarterback, Jalen Hurts, was dealing with has been dealing with turnover issues. But yesterday, yesterday, you guys, we saw how good this defense can actually be when they play motivated, when they play inspired, when they actually play with some level of pride and self-respect and with the chip on their shoulder. We saw what this team, what this defense can look like when they are clicking, in particular the defense. We saw how good this defense can be when they are clicking on all cylinders. Like I said before, the Saints came into this game red hot. Back-to-back -back weeks, dropping 40 points on your opponent. They put up over 90 points over the course of two games. They were one of the most efficient teams in the league, one of the best running teams. They were putting massive points on the board. They were efficient. They were scoring con on consecutive drives back-to-back-to-back-to-back-to-back. -to -back -to -back -to -back -to -back. Their defense was playing well, didn't allow a single opponent to put up 20 points on them over the past couple weeks. They were very, very good top to bottom. They looked well coached. Clint Kubiak, their new OC, looked like he had the pulse of that team. Derek Carr looked like he had new life. Alvin Kamara looked fresher than ever. So coming to that game, coming into that game, we knew the Saints had plenty of equity. Or let's just say they had plenty of heat turning behind their name. They, they were literally the most explosive team in football over the past two weeks. That's a fact. We can't change the narrative now. Now, of course, you got to monitor your expectations over the course of two weeks, right? It's only been two weeks. You can't really judge a team in that small of a sample size. But based on what they've done, they were – by far the most dominant and the most effective and the most explosive team over the first two weeks of the season. That is a fact. Nobody can change that narrative. They will try, but that's a fact. And you have to, at the end of the day, you got to play the team as they are, not as you think they are or, or, or as you expect them to be. You got to play a team as they show you. And so far, the Saints were a team that were putting massive numbers on the board. They smacked the Cowboys on the road. They smacked the Panthers, even though it's not a hard feat. But the, but the big one was beating the Cowboys in Jerry World, in Big Dallas. So yesterday, we saw how good this defense can be when they play motivated, when they play inspired, when they play up to the competition. And the Eagles came in and shut them down. And I'm not talking about, you know, a spotty performance. That defense, that Eagles defense was flying around the yard all day from beginning to end. Did they have a drive? Did they have a drive in there when they gave up a, some point tearing their short? They gave up two field goals and a touchdown. They were, they were, they were. Stonewalling them in the red zone. They gave a one touchdown on the back end. You know, it's only a matter of time, right? That that Saints team is still a good, it's still a talented offense. They're going to put some kind of points on the board. So you can't keep them out the end zone forever. But to hold them to 12 points when they were averaging 40 plus points a week, when they were averaging north of 400 yards of offense, 350 yards of offense over the past two weeks, and you hold them. You hold them to under 250 yards of total offense? Oh, my God. Come on, man. We're going to get into all of that. We're going to get into all of that. We're going to get into it. You held this team, the New Orleans Saints, to season lows in rushing, passing, and total yards and points scored. You held them to season lows in damn near every meaningful category. And on top of that, their two most explosive players so far through the first two games their, first, their most explosive players, their two most explosive players on offense were neutralized. Completely neutralized. Non-factors for the most part in that game. Did not make, did, did not do anything meaningful. Those two players, Alvin Kamara, Rashid Shahid. Now, obviously, Chris Alave is the number one. 
in New Orleans. Chris Olave is a better wide receiver than Rashid Shaheed. I'm not going to sit here and argue with you guys about that. But in terms of being their most explosive player over the past two weeks, Rashid Shaheed has been their most explosive wide receiver. Rashid Shaheed has been their speed guy, the guy that can take the top off of the defense. Alvin Kamara, another player who has been their most explosive on that offense. They were relying, they had been relying on Alvin Kamara. Alvin Kamara's production is a direct catalyst to their success. That's a fact. Listen to this. Let me try to give y'all some perspective. Let me give y'all some perspective, okay? Because y'all my people, and this is what we do here. Check this out. I posted this on Twitter, and I want you guys to just take a gander. Check this out. Prior to yesterday's game, prior to yesterday's game, Saints receiver Rashid Shaheed, Seven receptions on nine targets through two games. 169 receiving yards, averaging 24 yards of reception and two touchdowns. Prior to yesterday's game, seven catches, 169, averaging 24 yards a catch, two touchdowns. He has, he has been, by definition, their most explosive player, averaging 24 yards of reception. Seriously? That's insane. That's the Sean Jackson numbers. But when he played the Philadelphia Eagles, oh, no, no, no. Five targets, no receptions, no reception yards, no touchdowns, a complete non-factor. Darius Slay was in that ass. Quinn Mitchell was in that ass. Come on, man. Strapped. Put the clamps on him. Shark bite. Alligator bite. You're not letting go. You feel what I'm saying? Rashid Shaheed, non-factor. Non-factor. Because that defense stepped up in a way that we did not anticipate. Alvin Kamara. Alvin Kamara. Listen to this. Let me give y'all some numbers from Alma Kamara. Let me give y'all some numbers because Alma Kamara, again, again, I can show y'all better than I can tell y'all. And for those of you who are listening on Apple Podcasts and on Spotify, I'm going to read this off to you guys. Those of you guys who are watching on YouTube and watching on Spotify, you guys will be able to see this. Check this out. Alvin Kamara, man, when I say he's been their most productive player, he's been their most productive. He's been one of the most productive players. All right. Follow me here, you guys. Sorry about the little hiccup. All right. Alvin Kamara. <coughs> Against Carolina, 15 carries, 83 yards. Averaged over five yards a carry, a rushing touchdown, five catches, 27 yards. He had over 100 yards from scrimmage, averaged five yards a touch, and a touchdown. Let's go to the Dallas game, right, where they beat him 44-19. 20 carries, 115 rushing yards, averaged almost six yards of reception, or six yards of rush, three touchdowns, two catches, 65 yards, a touchdown. He had four touchdowns and over 180 yards, or he had 180 yards from scrimmage. He was averaging, I want to say, damn near 10 yards of play or damn near 10 yards of touch, Alvin Kamara. And then against the Eagles, 26 carries, 87 yards, only averaged three yards of touch. He did had oh he did have over 120 yards from scrimmage. I will give him that. Right? He had that big catch 
in the passing game on Zach Bond. Quarter for 27 yards. That was a big catch. I give him that. But if you take away that 27-yard catch, he only has 13 yards on two targets, on two catches. Follow me here. If he if he got 27 yards on that one catch on Zach Bond, you take away 27 yards from that 40, that leaves 13. You mean to tell me he only got 13 yards receiving if you exclude that big play? So again, the Philadelphia Eagles did a good job suppressing Alva Kamara. They did a good job suppressing Rashid Shaheed. And you want to know why that works so well? You want to know why that's such a big deal, Eagles fans? Because the reason Rashid Shaheed was able to benefit from this offense in such a way, the reason Rashid Shaheed was so explosive is because he was able to get open in the play action. The play action would be set up by Alvin Kamara's Ill illustrious play. So when you eliminate Alvin Kamara from the, from the equation, and then you eliminate the play action, that neutralizes how good of a quarterback Derek Carr can be, which then in turn neutralizes Rashid Shaheed's impact on the defense. The perfect cocktail for disaster was a successful running game by the Saints, which would lead to a successful play action game, which would give Rashid Shaheed full real estate to operate. Because now your defense has to respect the run. But because your defense was so stout against the run game, they didn't have to respect the play action at all, which gave the Eagles a leg up in the passing game, in pass defense, which gave Quinion Mitchell opportunity to recover, which gave Devontae, which gave Darius Slay opportunities to recover. CJ, GJ, and Reed Blankenship, right? Now, CJ, GJ, he did give up the touchdown to uh, Chris Olave, but again, they were stout all game. You're going to give up something to that team. They're talented. But again, like I said, it's a chain reaction. It's a cumulative effect. Because we said this prior to the game. Remember this. We said this prior to the game. Who will the Saints be? Who will Derek Carr be without the run game? And we found out when we neutralized Alvin Kamara. He was not able to get to the edges. He was not able to break one. I give so much credit to Zach Bond and BG for being amazing in the run game, especially when it came to setting the edge. Josh Sweat, same thing, did very well setting the edge tonight or yesterday. Jalen Carter was spectacular. Jalen Carter was the best player on the field yesterday by far. He was dominant. He was the, did you know in that game, Jalen Carter was the highest graded DT so far on the season? According to Pro Football Focus, according to Pro Football Focus, and, I, and again, I don't take their word for gospel. I take it with a grain of salt. But did you know, according to, according to Pro Football Focus, Jalen Carter was the highest graded defensive tackle throughout the NFL for the extent of the season? Like, it's, 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 it's pretty remarkable. Again, the Saints relied heavily on Alvin Kamara. He... The, the Saints were a well-balanced team. As a matter of fact, they were running more than they were passing. They were using the they were using the run to set up the pass. And they were taking so much pressure off of Derek Carr with that running game. With Alva Kamara averaging five, six yards of carry prior to yesterday's game. And then you hold him to three yards of carry, 26 carries, 87 yards. Not much of a factor in this game. Getting stonewalled. Man. Man, man, that's the best that defense has played in, what, two years? Let's be honest with ourselves. That's the best game the defense has played in, what, two years, correct? Or at least a year and a half, last season and this year? That's the best defense I've seen him play. The best defense I've seen him play in over a year. So we found out who Derek Carr was without the running game. We found out who Derek Carr was when Rashid Shaheed can't get off, right? Chris Olave, he, he, he got his numbers. Chris Olave had, what, five catches for like 80-something yards, had a touchdown.
but he was a non-factor. He did convert some key third downs for the Saints. I will give them that. They did go to him as their go-to guy. But for the most part, he was a non-factor. And the biggest takeaway for me that we haven't talked about yet on the show is how they started the game with the five-man fronts. The Philadelphia Eagles showed their hand from the get-go. They made it very clear in that game. You will not run the ball. You're going to have to, you're going to have to kill us to run this ball. Vic Fangio started that game out with five-man fronts, and they held up those five-man fronts for the better part of that game. I think once they got deeper into the third and deeper into the fourth quarter, you saw the five-man fronts turn into four-man fronts. But for the most part in that game, the Eagles played in five-man fronts, and they were remarkable. And whenever they were in a four-man front, you would see them be in the nickel formation, right? And then you would see Zach Bond leak down to the edge to seal off. That was the that was the trickery, right? When the Saints thought they had a running lane, you would see Zach Bond start out in the nickel spot, right? Or you would see Zach Bond start out, right? Or the defense would start out in the nickel formation. You'll see Zach Bond right there floating on the second level. And then right before the snap, Zach Bond would, would line up right next to BG on the edge. Or he'll line up right next to Bryce Huff on the edge. And they would seal off. The running game, they did a great job scouting the Philadelphia Eagles. I mean, the Eagles did a great job scouting the Saints. The Saints love to get on the edge with their running back, Alvin Kamara. Their zone running scheme, Chef's Kiss by Vic Fangio. Chef's Kiss by Vic Fangio. So like I said, we found out exactly who Derek Carr was. And I'm going to get to your comments, you guys. Trust me, I'm going to get to him. And I'm going to get to the Super Chats. Thank you guys so much for supporting the show. We found out exactly who Derek Carr was. The Eagles defense held Derek Carr to a 56% completion percentage, forcing him to go 14 to 25, 142 passing yards, one touchdown and one interception. That's the second quarterback the Philadelphia Eagles have held to under 60% completion percentage. That's the second quarterback the Philadelphia Eagles have held to a completion percentage of less than 60%. They've held Jordan Love to about 56-57% completion percentage in that game in week one. They held Derek Carr to 56% completion percentage. There were times last year where quarterbacks customarily 70%, 65%, sometimes 80% completion percentage. That's not that's not bad, Eagles fans. That's not bad at all. Was that run defense horrible the first two weeks? Absolutely. Was that pass rush horrible the first two weeks? Absolutely. But the red zone defense is legitimate. Um, the passing defense in terms of the DBs is improved. Your linebacker play is improved based off of that performance in the Saints game. D line play has taken a step forward. Can they string it together? Can they be more consistent? That's the bigger question. But but again, I want to I want I want to stay more on the positive. I want to stay more in the moment here. Keep smashing that like button, y'all. I appreciate the love. I appreciate the support. Thank y'all so much. Keep hitting that like button. Once again, Derek Carr was held to a 56% completion percentage, forcing him to go 14 of 25 throwing the ball, 142 passing yards. One passing touchdown and one interception. Let me show y'all something else, by the way. Let me show y'all something else, because y'all my people. I love y'all for this. I love y'all. Let me show y'all something else. Check this out. Check this out, check this out, check this out. Darius Slay and Quinn Mitchell had a day. Check this out. So... According to my man, Jeff Kerr from CBS, shout out to Jeff Kerr, that's my guy. According to him, Derek Carr, when targeting the Eagles corners in week three, Quinion Mitchell was three of, Quinion Mitchell forced Derek Carr to go three of five for 29 yards with a 64.6 passer rating. Darius Slay forced Derek Carr to go one of two on nine yards with a 56.3 passer rating. 
combined, Quinion Mitchell and Darius Slay allowed Derek Carr to go four for seven for 38 yards with an average passer rating of 60. That was some quick math, if you guys didn't notice. <laughs> but Quinion Mitchell and Darius Slay were for, were phenomenal. Is it fair? To say that Quinn Mitchell can extend Darius Slay's career? I know we haven't talked about this yet, right? And I know a lot of you guys are ready to move on from Slay. And I know a lot of us have, I know a lot of us have spoken about how this may be Darius Slay's last year in Philadelphia. But is it fair to surmise that if Darius Slay can stay healthy, hopefully that injury he dealt with didn't hamper him too much from penning doing a dirty play? But is it is it possible? Is it possible that Quinnia Mitchell can extend Slay's career? Just asking, the, just asking the question off the top of my head. I didn't need you guys. I didn't even game plan for that question. I, I just that just came off the top of my head. That just came off the top of my head. I just want to ask you guys. That's all. That's all. But kudos to Quinnia Mitchell. Kudos to Darius Slay for shutting down. Rashid Shahid and keeping Chris Olave um, contained for the most part. You know what this tells me also? This tells me Derek Carr was trying to attack our linebackers. Derek Carr was trying. You know what this? Yo, you guys, follow me here, right? Okay, okay, we got it. Y'all don't want to slay here. We got it. Y'all don't want to slay here. We get it. All right. Follow me here. Listen to this, right? Again, this is me just thinking on the fly now. If Quinion Mitchell and Darius Slate were only targeted seven times between the between the two, right? And if Derek Carr threw 25 attempts, so listen, out of 25 attempts by Derek Carr, seven of those attempts went to either Quinion Mitchell or Darius Slay. That means, that means 18 of his 25 attempts, he was targeting linebackers, he was targeting the slot. He still couldn't get off. He still couldn't get off. 18 of his 25 targets, he was targeting Devontae Maddox. He was targeting Zach Bond and Kobe Dean. He probably was targeting Reed Blankenship and CJ GJ. He still couldn't get off. That's the reality. Moving on. Now, Although the Eagles only got one sack in this game as a team, courtesy of Jordan Davis, got to give a lot of love to Jordan Davis. Jordan Davis was amazing. He did a great job um, holding the line. He did a great job getting off his blocks, did a great job getting tackles for loss, um, pass deflections, a sack. He was, he was amazing. He was good in the pass rush. He was good in run defense. I think I feel like Vic Vic Fangio did an amazing job rotating his defensive line. He did an amazing job reading um, reading the room. We're, listen, we're going to give everybody their flowers. We're going to talk about everybody. Trust me, we're giving everybody their flowers. You guys, don't worry. We're getting we're getting, giving everybody their flowers today. But Jordan Davis was extremely effective. Um, the Eagles' pass rush as a whole, was extremely effective. They forced Derek Carr into several poor decisions with the football. The Eagles were dominant in run defense as well. Jalen Carter! Jalen Carter! Brad Man! The baby rhino! Jalen Carter is the real motherfucking deal! You can't tell me nothing about that man. Can't tell me nothing. Brad man. Brad man. Jalen Carter was a menace. He dominated the trenches. He deflected two passes at the line of scrimmage. And he also had two tackles for loss. He looked spectacular in the run game. He looked spectacular rushing the passer. I want to give a lot of love to Zach Bond. Yo, Zach Bond. I told y'all. I told y'all when we signed Zach Bond, 
as we were making it through training camp and, you know, the OTAs and mandatory minicamp, I, I told y'all, I said, listen, Zach Bond is going to be a, 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 a decent player. Some of y'all didn't believe me. Why didn't you believe me? <laughs> Yo. Oh, my God. Listen, I'm going to get to your chats. I'm going to get to your comments. Trust me. I got you. I got you. I got you. I got you. I'm getting every super chat. It's not in vain, y'all. But why didn't you believe me? Why didn't you believe me? I said Zach Bond is going to be a solid player. I said, listen, I don't know how good, but I think he's going to be all right. I said, it's something about him. I, I, I can feel it. I can feel it. I can feel it. So far, Zach Barnes has delivered you two spectacular games out of three. Let's be honest. Zach Barnes is in the green. Zach Barnes is in the green. We got to stop lying. Zach Barnes is in the green. So far through three weeks, he's given you two spectacular performances. He's in the green. So simple as that. And we're gonna and we're gonna get to the super chats, even the dumb ones. Don't worry. We're gonna get to the super chats, even the dumb ones. Because they still gotta play tonight. We're gonna get to all of them. And I appreciate y'all for locking on the content. I'm still getting through, I'm still getting through this this uh this topic here with you guys. I'm still getting through this. So yeah. And uh sorry for going through some Wi-Fi issues, you guys. My apologies. So, yeah, Jordan Davis was spectacular. Zach Bond, Jalen Carter, um, Nicobe Dean played very, very, very well. Very well. Nicobe Dean has shocked me. He's been, he's been phenomenal. He's been phenomenal. I got to be honest. Nicobe Dean has played way better than I thought he would. And Nicobe Dean has become somebody that I am not paying too much attention to. For good reason. For good reason. For good reason, you guys. Nicole Dean, you, you, you got to appreciate it. But BG was great. Jordan Davis, Milton Williams, Thomas Booker played well again. Moro Jomo was good. Josh Sweat was solid. Nolan Smith actually had a, pretty, had a decent game. Nolan Smith got pressure. Nolan Smith was all right. Nolan Smith was good in run defense, too. They was all right. The worst player on the, on the D-line was Bryce Huff. Bryce Huff continues to be a liability in run defense. He's very, he's very inconsistent. He's very inconsistent in the run game. He has not been able to get pressure in the pass rush. And if you noticed, it got to a point, it got to a point in that game where Zach Bond and BG were taking his snaps on the edge especially in early down situations. And he would come in during clear pass scenarios, like third and long. But for the most part, for the most part, Bryce Huff, they didn't trust him in the run defense. They didn't trust him in the run game. That's a fact. I want to give credit to Darius Slade, Quinion Mitchell, Avante Maddox, Reed Blankenship, and CJ GJ. They played very well as a group. Um, Quinion Mitchell ended the game with two pass deflections. The biggest thing, the biggest takeaway from that game on defense is that no one on the Saints offense was able to dictate the terms of engagement. And that's the type of defense you want your guys playing. Overall, the Eagles held the Red Hot Saints offense to 219 total yards, 130 passing yards, 89 rush yards, and forced the game ceiling interception by Reed Blankenship, which was caused by the pressure up the middle by BG and off the edge by Josh Sweat. Reed Blankenship, another player that I've been high on, another player that I've always liked. Some of you guys will criticize him. Is he the fastest player? No. Is he the most athletic? No. But he is instinctual. He knows where to be. He knows how to get that burst of speed. He knows how to get that burst of speed to get that interception. His ball skills are legitimate. He has good hands. He tackles very well. He's good at run defense. Man, oh, man. Reed Blankenship, we're right now, we're getting a steal for his services. 
He right now he leads the Eagles in interceptions. He has two in the season, two in the first three games. He's done very well. Very, very, very well. So kudos to Reed Blankenship. Quinn Mitchell, brother, you're getting so close. You are getting so close to these interceptions, brother. You got to catch one of them. You would have, yo, Quinn Mitchell could have had three pick sixes in three weeks. But nonetheless, he still gets the he still gets the PD, the pass deflections. And um, he's playing very well, man, for a rookie. Not bad for a corner out of Toledo. Just saying. Not, not bad for a cornerback out of Toledo. Not bad for a corner out of the Mac. You feel what I'm saying? Not bad. So I want to give credit. I'm going to give kudos to Vic Fangio. I want to give kudos to Clint Hurt, the D-line coach. I want to give credit to Christian Parker, the passing game coordinator and the defensive backs coach for the defense. I want to give credit to Roy Anderson, the cornerbacks coach, Joe Casper, the safeties coach, Bobby King, the interior linebackers coach, Jeremiah Washburn, the edge and off and, and, and off ball linebackers coach. I give credit to those coaches this week on defense. They got those fellas right. They practice hard. And it all showed up on the field. I got to give credit to those coaches. They got those boys right. That's a fact. Vic Fangio said, listen, all right, it's been two weeks. I've been trying my hardest to not have to get to these five-man fronts. I've been trying to see if we can stop the run with four-man fronts. Okay. Enough is enough. You saw your coordinator make an adjustment. Not five weeks or not eight or ten weeks into a season. You saw your coordinator and your defensive coaches make an adjustment three weeks into the season. That's what you're supposed to do. You give your team a fair shot at something. You give them a fair opportunity to prove they can do one thing. If they can't prove it to you, you make an adjustment. This is what I was talking about, right? Making the necessary adjustments so things don't get out of hand. So things don't snowball on you. So now... Teams have to respect your defense for what they've shown against that offense. They have to respect it now. I give so much respect, so much kudos to those coaches on defense. Vic Fangio, Clint Hurt, Christian Parker, Roy Anderson, Joe Casper, Bobby King, Jeremiah Washburn. I give so much credit to those guys. And I give so much credit to the players for being, for being receptive, for receiving the coaching. So much credit, so much credit to go around on the defense side of the ball. The performance was huge. It was a confidence booster. And now, now, Eagles fans, it's now time for this defense, for these players to start stringing together these performances. Can we, can we connect the dots? Can we start to build this brick by brick? Can we stack these performances? Each week, we've had something positive to say about the red zone defense, right? So that's becoming a trend. The Eagles have a real, a real red zone defense. That's a fact. Three weeks in a row, back against the wall, that, that, that red zone defense is, is legitimate. But the run defense in the pass rush, that was the question mark. You struggled in back-to-back -back week, in back-to-back -back weeks, week one and week two. In week one, you saw flashes of a strong run defense, right? They did keep Josh Jacobs bottled up the first half in week one. But then second half, they couldn't stop him. And then week two, run defense was non-existent. Pass rush was non-existent. Week three, run defense, stout. Pass rush, very, very prevalent. You got to stack these days. You got you to gotta string these together. You have to continue to play complimentary football. I loved what I saw from that defense. And going forward, the Eagles are going to need more from Bryce Huff. They're going to need more. There were some run fits where I saw Bryce Huff like, okay, all right, good job. There were some far in between, though. But for the most part, non-factor. But overall, again, the performance, huge confidence booster for the defense. Now you got to stack the days. Now you got to stack the reps. Continue to play up, continue to play above the rim. Don't play down to the competition. Everybody deserves to get touched. 
Everybody deserves to get their head taken off. Simple as that. What's good, sports fans? Are you ready to elevate your live entertainment experience? Well, let me introduce you to SeatGeek, an amazing platform that connects you to your favorite events while saving you money. With SeatGeek, you can easily find tickets for sports games, concerts, and so much more, all in one place. The interface is user-friendly, making it simple to browse and compare prices. And one of the best features is the interactive seating chart. You can see exactly where you'll be sitting and how much you'll be spending, ensuring you get the best value for your money. But here's the best part. Check this out. By using my promo code, Chalk It Up Sports, you can enjoy a one-time $20 discount on your first SeatGeek order. That's right, $20 off your first SeatGeek order. Imagine catching that thrilling game or concert without breaking the bank. It's a win-win situation. Plus, you'll be a part of a community of fans who eat, sleep, and breathe live events just as much as you do. So what are you waiting for? Click the link in the description to download the SeatGeek app today. And don't forget to use my promo code, Chalk It Up Sports, for a one-time $20 discount on your first SeatGeek order. Get excited. Now let's get back to the show.